the principle of neuroplasticity, which says that what fires together wires together. So if I have this craving and this thought that I could just start tomorrow, and then I reward those by eating the chocolate, I'm more likely to have both the craving and the thought tomorrow. So I've made my problem worse. And if you're in a hole, you got to stop digging, use the present moment to eat healthy. It's the only time you can feed yourself. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who is out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is psychologist Glenn Livingston, and we're going to be talking about overeating, food obsession, and weight loss. But first, let me invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can see photos of my guests, synopses of the episodes, listen to the episodes, a little bio on myself, And there's a donate button if you'd like to support the show through Patreon. Thank you. There's also the YouTube channel, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman, and with Bob Nickman for listening on YouTube, and The Exploding Human Facebook page. As I said, my guest today is Glenn Livingston. Glenn has uh, a long history in the field of psychology, and he is going to be talking about his own personal journey with being a chocoholic, as well as some other food issues and being overweight, and uh, the decades he spent trying to figure out what was going on with him. And he became disillusioned with what traditional psychology had to offer um, overweight and uh, food-obsessed individuals, and he spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating via his work with his own patients and self-funded research. And he has come up with some very interesting points. And uh, we talk about the reptilian brain and how we process information and what are the causes of overeating, binge eating, and how we can remedy that situation. Glenn is a font of knowledge in this field. Uh, I really enjoy talking to him, and I think you'll enjoy hearing his take on this topic very informative. Please welcome to the show. This is Glenn Livingston. So happy to meet you, Glenn, because I looked at all your bio and uh, all your all the things that you've done. And it's very, uh, very impressive in that it's um, comes from your own experience. It um, does. Yeah. With uh, weight and eating. And it's a huge deal, particularly in the United States, a lot of overweight people, a lot of people struggling with food. Why don't we start with your story of, because I know that you uh, struggle with obesity at, at one point in your life. And today, you, even though people can't see you because this is audio, I can see you on Zoom and you look completely healthy and fantastic. So I, I'm a healthy, normal guy, but more or less. More or less. <laughs> At least my mom thought so. Well, if, um, yeah, if there is such a thing, you're it. <laughs> th- thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah. So, hey, did you ever get to um, Woodbury, Long Island? Have you ever been in the New York area or in Woodbury, Long Island? I have not been there. I've been to Manhattan, but not to Long Island. Well, if you've been to Woodbury, Long Island, and you stopped by the Woodbury Country Deli, and you found that they were out of pizza or chocolate or Pop-Tarts, th- there's a really good chance that I was there before you. Okay. <laughs> um, in the 90s, in the 90s. <laughs> I was a pop tart um, freak when I was a kid. Oh my God. I was, my, my mother used to make me, a, uh, she'd leave me a box of six chocolate fudge pop tarts sitting on the kitchen table for breakfast every morning because I came down before her. How and sweet. Then, <laughs> and I literally, how sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I ate a vegetable until I was um, 16 or 17 years old. <laughs> so, so, as you might surmise, I'm not just a doctor that 
decided to work with overweight people. I'm a guy who really struggled himself. I am, um, you know, my, my top weight was probably close to 300 pounds. I don't know exactly because I stopped weighing myself and I was, I just couldn't bear to look at the scale. Um, but it, it all started when I was in my uh, teenage years and I'm 6'4 and I'm modestly muscular. And I figured out that if I worked out a few hours a day, I could eat whatever I wanted to. I mean, anything not nailed down, whole pizzas, maybe two of them, boxes of munchkins, boxes of muffins, um, pop, pop tarts, chocolate bars, whatever you could imagine. And I, I thought it was great. I didn't think it was a problem. I, I thought it was um, kind of like a superpower. Doug Graham taught me that word. It's kind of like a superpower that I had. And I spent too much time eating and too much time in the gym and too much time pooping, quite frankly. Um, but other than that, you know, I was tall and thin and modestly handsome and I was doing okay with the ladies and, and I was a happy teenager. I was a happy teenager. But as I got older, and I went to graduate school and I was married and was 22 or 23 years old. I couldn't find the time to work out for, you know, more than two half hours a week, much less um, two hours a day. Because I was commuting two hours a, way to, a day each way to graduate school and seeing patients and reading books and um, helping my ex-wife with the business at the time. And um, I just couldn't do it. But I found that the food had a hold of me anyway. And I kept eating the same way that I was. And I, you know, would start to gain weight, but that really wasn't the thing that bothered me the most. What, what really bothered me the most was my inability to concentrate when I was in session with patients. Because I, I come from a family of 17 psychotherapists. And um, it's what was always most important to me was being a fantastic psychologist. And to be a fantastic psychologist you, it's a, it's a lot more than an intellectual endeavor. I mean, I, I read a lot of things. I studied a lot of things. I did a lot of research. So I knew a lot of stuff, but it, really people are not going to change unless you lend them your soul. You, you got to be right where there with them. You got to get them to love you and trust you enough to think new thoughts and say new things and, you know, leave their comfort zone. And, and I'd be sitting with, you know, a suicidal client and I'd be thinking, when, when can I get to the pizza place? Or, you know, with a couple right after an affair, and I'd be thinking, um, you know, when, when can I go to the deli and dislodge my jaw and open the, the slide the deli tray into it, you know? And I'm, I'm only half exaggerating. I'm only half kidding because it really yeah. was like that. No, I get I, it, man. You're, 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 the obsession starts to talk to you and it doesn't care about what else is going on. And life is always about the next meal or the next snack or the next treat. Yeah. 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 Um, and so coming from the family that I came from, I figured there must be a psychological cure. I figured there's something psychologically wrong with me. Maybe I've got a hole in my heart, right? Metaphorically, I got a hole in my heart. And if I could fill that hole in my heart, then I could stop trying to fill the hole in my stomach. And so I went to the best psychologist and psychiatrist, and you can imagine we knew them in the family I came from. Um, I took medication. I went to Overeaters Anonymous, it took a, like a 20 year journey trying to figure out how do I love myself then? I must not love myself enough. How do I love myself then? Right. And unfortunately, although it was a very soulful journey and I don't regret taking it, learned a lot about myself. I you know, had some spiritual pursuits that woke me up in some ways. But but um, although I, I I really learned a lot about myself, my eating didn't get better. It would get I would get a little thinner and a lot fatter, a little thinner and a lot fatter. And somewhere in the, I guess I was around 40 years old. So that would be as we're um, approaching the early 2000s. I, I, I started thinking a little differently. And there are three things that made me think differently. And I'll, I'll tell you what the solution to me became more of an alpha dog, like be the alpha wolf in your own mind. Um, and, and, you know, fight these challenging thoughts kind of approach more than a love myself thin approach. Mm -hmm. But there were three things that convinced me of that. First, I'd studied to, I started to study neurology a little bit. And the neurology of food addiction has more to do with the reptilian brain, the, the feast and famine systems, the, the survival drive that doesn't really know love. 
see when the reptilian thinks this, this is the reptilian brain I, we're on audio so i'm making a fist here yeah um, if you think of the fist as the reptilian brain when the reptilian brain sees something in the environment it says do i eat it do i mate with it or do i kill it it's like a bad college drinking game. It's like eat, mate, or kill. <laughs> right? But I mean, that, that's how it is. That, that's a, I mean, there are arguments that say reptiles can love also, but basically it's eat, mate, or kill. So, so, well, that's interesting. It's not until you get to the mammalian brain that says, wait, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, and that's I'm putting my hand on top of my fist, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on the people that you love or the tribe that you're with. And then it's the neocortex on top of that, I'm putting my hand on top of my other hand, that says, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact will that have on your long-term goals, on your strategic thinking, on your creativity, on your music, and your art, and your relationships, and everything that makes you the human being you're trying to be in this modern world that we live in. And so that's interesting. I'm spending... 20 years trying to love myself then, but the part of my brain that responds to food addiction doesn't know love. Then because my ex-wife um, traveled for business and we didn't have kids and I didn't commute, I had an awful lot of time on my hands. And I started a second business on top of my clinical practice. And by the way, I was not working with overeating clients. I was um, a child and family therapist at the time Okay. Um, because I, I had a problem myself. I didn't feel it was ethical for me to work with over any people, I would usually refer them out. Um, any, anyway, she was traveling for business. I started this consulting gig and I was working with mostly Fortune 500 big food companies and big pharma companies. And I freely admit I was on the wrong side of the war. I'm contrite about it now. I'm trying to make up for it. <laughs> I forgive but, you. How about thank that? Thank you. I, I'm not sure I forgive myself yet. But I, I, um, what I saw there, Bob, was that these companies were engineering these hyper palatable food-like substances. And the purpose of them was to hit the bliss point in the reptilian brain without giving you enough nutrition to feel satisfied. Ugh, and, that's diabolical. <laughs> well, it, it is kind of diabolical. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we could get into that. All We yeah. could get into an argument about um, what does the consumer really want? And do they want plausible deniability or do they really want something healthy? But that's a separate story. But the bottom line is they're engineering these, um, you know, concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and excitotoxins and salt. And, and, and every time you're looking for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or a container, there's some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache that's laughing all the way to the back, right? And so the, the point was, this was a very external force. It had nothing to do with my personal psychology. It had to do with my physiology and their understanding of my physiology. And they have billions of dollars to spend on this kind of stuff, right? And rocket scientists galore, which is why some of the mindful eating folks, although I think they're onto something, I don't think they have the whole story because these food-like substances are engineered to break your hungry and full meters. You know, you, I don't think it's really possible to mindfully eat some of the things that we have in our society today because your sensation, your, it's, it's just not there, right? Yes, so, absolutely. So I, I knew that. I saw that the advertising industry was equally as capable of fooling our reptilian brain into thinking, this is what we need to survive. So for example, I was working with a major food bar manufacturer who shall remain nameless so we don't get sued. And this, the uh, VP of marketing hung his head in shame to me as he's leaving the company. And he said, I got to tell you something. Our most profitable insight was to take the vitamins out of the bar because they were too expensive and they were making them taste bad. So what we did instead is we took the money and we put it into the packaging and they made it look multicolored and vibrant and you know, like, like almost like you were eating the rainbow. And we're, we're told to eat the rainbow because when you get a salad with, you know, dark green lettuce and blueberries and red tomatoes and, you know, yellow peppers and stuff, you're, you're, you're getting a diversity of micronutrients and your brain knows that it's evolutionarily programmed to look for that. But in this case, they're hitting those buttons without giving you the nutrition. I don't mean to single them out. This goes on across the industry. I could tell you story after story. Um, but so, so I kind of said to myself, I got to stop trying to love myself then. You know, when, 
when an, I have to be the alpha wolf of my own mind. And when an alpha wolf is challenged for leadership, it doesn't go, oh my goodness, someone needs a hug. It growls and it snarls and it says, get back in line or I'll kill you, right? I have to be the alpha wolf of my own mind. Um, the big food industry, the big advertising industry are telling us the wrong thing, creating a perfect storm for addiction. They are very powerful. People think advertising doesn't affect them, but it affects them more when they think it doesn't affect them because their resistance is down. And then there's the big addiction treatment center that says, well, if you're really addicted to these things, you can't quit even if you want to. The best thing you could do is abstain one day at a time. These are irresistible impulses and only God can remove them from you. Um, and there's no real evidence that 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 works. So I kind of put it all together when I said enough is enough. And this is kind of crazy. And I'm a little embarrassed to say what I did next. Oh, I left out a little piece. I'm sorry. The last thing I did before flipping paradigms was my own research study. I was getting paid an awful lot of money to do these big research studies for these corporations. So I set up my own and I intercepted over the course of many years when clicks were cheap, I intercepted about 40,000 people and I got them to take a survey. And I intercepted them when they were searching for solutions to stress online. And I asked them a couple of things about their personality. And I asked them what foods they can't stop eating when they feel stressed. Mm -hmm. And I found three very interesting things, which at the time I thought might be the emotional solution. And it turned out there really wasn't an emotional solution. Um, the things I found were that people that started their binges with chocolate, like I did, were lonely or brokenhearted in some way, more so than other people. The people who started their binges with uh, crunchy, salty things tended to be stressed at work. And the people who started their binges with soft, chewy, starchy things like bagels and pasta and breads, they tended to be stressed at home. And so I called my mom to really try to put this together because my mom was a therapist and she raised me and she's also a chocoholic. And I, and I said, mom, why could this be? I have this really interesting thing. And yes, I'm not in a great marriage and I'm kind of a little lonely and brokenhearted, but why is it that I rent the chocolate? Why do you rent the chocolate when you get stressed? And she goes, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. And I said, mom, it's okay. It's okay. It, whatever happened, it was 40 years ago. It would be 50 years ago now. But wh whatever happened was a very long time ago. And I don't care. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of this. And, and she says, well, you know, in 1965, when you were one year old, my father, your grandfather had just gotten out of prison. And I had no idea that he was guilty. And my whole life, I idolized him. He was my savior. And I just fell apart. I was so depressed. At the same time, your dad my husband was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. And I was terrified because we're trying to get pregnant with your sister. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be an army widow with two young kids. And I don't, I don't know what, so I'd be sitting and staring at the wall and worrying about that and feeling horribly depressed. And you'd come running up to me and say, and, you know, want love or hugs or cuddles or, you know, or something healthy to eat. And I didn't have it to give. I just didn't have the wherewithal to give it to you all the time. In fact, most of the time I didn't. And I'm so sorry, but what I did is I got a little refrigerator and I kept it on the floor and I got a bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup, which kind of. I remember me. that stuff. Yeah. Right. I'm glad. I'm glad somebody else does. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember when I used to have all my hair and teeth also. Uh, but, but, but then I go running over to the, um, I go running over to the bottle and I would take it out and I would, you know, open the cap and suck on the bottle and go into a chocolate sugar coma. And so if, if that were, if it was really an emotional solution, that would be our movie moment, right? Then mom and I should have had a big hug and a big cry, and I should never have trouble with chocolate again, because now we figured it out. But do you know that my chocolate eating actually got worse at that point? And the reason it got worse was because there was this little voice in my head. I'm not schizophrenic, but there, everybody knows when there's this little yeah, voice that says, sure. yeah. and, and, and the little voice would say something like, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough and she left a great big chocolate sized hole in our heart. And until we can find the love of our life, we're going to have to go right on eating it. So yippee, let's go get more right now. So it was this voice of justification. So this all comes together for me at this point. And I think maybe like if the emotion is the fire, maybe what this voice of justification is doing is poking holes in the fireplace. And a roaring fire in a well-contained fireplace in the living room is not a liability, it's an asset. 
people gather around, they tell stories, they hug, they laugh, they cry, they make memories. That's an asset, as long as the fireplace is well, well constructed. But if you poke holes in the fireplace, then ashes can get out and burn down the house. And I said, well, maybe for all these years I've been trying to put out the fire, maybe I don't have to do that. Maybe I have to fix this voice of justification. And so here's what I did, which is very embarrassing for a sophisticated psychologist. And I was not going to publish this. This was um, just a very private experiment. I decided that if I was going to catch this voice when it was trying to poke holes in the fireplace, I had to know when it was speaking as opposed to when I was speaking. So I would make a very clear rule with a very clear line in the sand that would say something like, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. I'll only ever had it on Saturday and Sunday. And then if I was in Starbucks and I heard a little voice in my head that said, you know what, Glenn, you worked out hard enough. You're not going to gain weight and it would be just as easy to start this silly chocolate rule tomorrow. Yippee, let's go have that you know, chocolate bar along with your latte. I would say, wait a minute, that's not me. I decided to call my reptilian brain my inner pig. I should have called it something else. I should have called it a food monster or I called it my inner pig. I, like I said, it was going to be private. I said, my inner pig is squealing for slop. Chocolate is pig slop. Chocolate is pig slop on a Wednesday. I don't need pig slop and I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as primitive as that sounds, as ridiculous as it sounds, it would give me a few extra microseconds at the moment of impulse, the moment of temptation to make the right decision if I wanted to. I can't say I immediately always made the right decision, but I did wake up and things seemed a lot clearer to me. Over time, I experimented with rules that were a little bit easier because I, I, I recognized that when I would wake up and make the right decision or adhere to the rule that I made before, I felt this sense of control and hope and enthusiasm. Uh, whereas if I listened to the pig, I started to find that it was beating down my spirit and I felt like I couldn't accomplish things and you know that I was never going to get over this. And so I decided to make keeping the pig in a cage the primary goal. I kind of put weight loss aside for a while and I just made the primary goal that I had to stick to the rules. So accordingly, I adjusted the rules and I made them a little easier. Um, and over time, I kept the journal. And in that journal, I would disempower the pig's logic. I, I found that the pig would always tell a half truth so it was seductive, but then there'd be some kind of cancerous logic that went along with it. Like for example, you know, you're, you're not gonna gain any weight because you worked out hard enough and it would be just as easy to start tomorrow. Now, it's true that if I had one chocolate bar with my coffee after a really rough workout, really tough workout, um, that I probably wouldn't gain any weight. It's likely that I would have more than one chocolate bar, because once I broke the rule, then I would want to have, you know, 47 sure. chocolate bars. Yeah. Um, it's likely I would follow that up with some pizza or something. So there was a lie in that logic. The pig makes it sound like it would be just as easy to start tomorrow because I won't gain any, gain any weight, but that's ignoring the principle of neuroplasticity, which says that what fires together, wires together. So if I have this craving and this thought that I could just start tomorrow, and then I reward those by eating the chocolate, I'm more likely to have both the craving and the thought tomorrow. So I've made my problem worse. And if you're in a hole, you gotta stop digging, use the present moment to eat healthy, it's the only time you can feed yourself. And so I, I kept a journal for about eight years with all these crazy things that the pig would say and why it was wrong. Like in, in exquisite detail, I got thin. Um, but it was more than I got then. I started eating a lot healthier. I, I figured out that when I was craving chocolate, sometimes there was an authentic bodily need underneath that. And that was usually met by some type of a green fruit smoothie. Um, and I feel a lot better when I did that. And, um, and so, so it stopped being this like white knuckling thing. And I just started feeling calmer and more well-nourished. And, you know, I got rid of rosacea and eczema and psoriasis and all kinds of other good things happened to my body as I lost weight and my triglycerides came down. But, but um, in the end, it was that I, you know, I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. That's really what empowered me. And as I was getting divorced in 2015, I was a minor partner in a publishing company from all my business dealings. And um, the CEO says, you know what, Glenn, we really need to publish our own book because we got to show the big authors that we really know what we're doing. And we don't have authors that are willing to kind of stick it out with us and do what we tell them to do. Would you write a book? 
And I said, well, I've got this crazy journal. She says, turn it into a book. I took the summer and turned it into a book. And two weeks later, he calls me back and he says, Glenn, donuts are pig slop. I don't eat donuts. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And he proceeds to lose almost 100 pounds over the next 18 months. And um, we published it. And I had no idea it was going to take off the way that it does. But now we've got 13,000 reviews and um, six more books. And that's what I do is I go around helping people consider whether they might have a pig inside them and whether or not they want to eat pig slop or not and come up with their own rules and, you know, decide how to eat better day by day. That's what I do. That was a great uh, little talk there. Damn. I, I'm not using little as a uh, way to diminish what you were saying. I'm saying it was succinct. Mm. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing because there's so much there. I have a lot of questions. Please. <laughs> I, I have a ton of questions. Please. Um, let's talk about the, let's first, let's talk about what you put in your body for the people listening, because I think there, um, for example, there's certain foods. I'll use my wife as an example. If she eats white rice, she gets hungrier. It yeah. cannot satisfy her. She can eat so much white rice that she, her stomach is hurting almost. And she still, it's, it makes her hungry. That's one of those, I guess you would call it a trigger food or a food that is just, is not compatible with her, um, her body because it, it, it's, it does not satisfy you. You, you never hear somebody go, Oh man, I ate so much broccoli. I can't even move. No one says that. Right. No, because it's healthy and it, in the, it tells the body when it's had enough and you're satisfied. What is it about certain foods like those kind of carb sugar family that that causes people to want to keep going? Well, let me just first qualify this by saying you can recover in any reasonable dietary philosophy that that you want, as long as you're nourishing your body. Um, I find statistics, and so our program is diet agnostic, and you don't necessarily have to give up anything if you don't. I, I don't eat white rice. I don't eat white flour. Um, I don't eat sugar. I don't drink alcohol. I just, I don't want those things in my body. I feel better without it, but two thirds of my clients still eat those kind of things. However, like you said, we, we didn't have the white rice on the Savannah when we were evolving, right? Nor did we have chips and you know, pizza and pop tarts either. Right. Um, you know, and if you look at the, let's take a banana, you look at the sugar in a banana. Um, it comes packaged with guar and pectin to slow down the assimilation of that sugar at, at just the right level. And I mean, we evolved with bananas, right? Um, but but when you if you were to just to strip the to dry out the banana and strip the sugar out of the banana and just you know make it into a juice or something like that, then you've removed the natural fiber and the enzymes that help you make use of that. So um, I. Like, I, I really think that processed foods are the enemy. And I I would fight for your right to have them if you want to. I think, like Jack Trimpey says, we fought wars, you know, for your freedom to do what you want to do in this country. Um, but I think it's more along the lines of the Hells Angels philosophy of live fast and die young but when you're eating those kind of things. And if you really want to make the most out of life, I think that it works out a lot better when you stay a little bit lower glycemic on the on the spectrum. And stay away from, um, you know, the white poisons, white, white sugar, white flour, salt, those kind of stuff, things. Yeah. The, and apparently from the things I've read that salt is just as um, destructive as sugar. A lot of people don't realize that it can, um, people give up sugar and they eat a ton of salt and they go, why, why are, why am I having kidney problems and other issues? Um, I, I don't eat sugar. Yeah. I, salt was the last thing to go for me. I, I was, what I didn't realize, because I never had high blood pressure, right? like up until very recently, I never had high blood pressure. But what I didn't realize is that the, um, the blood vessels respond to the added pressure that salt puts through them temporarily in the same way that the muscles respond to added weight. I, I'm not a medical doctor, by the way. I've heard this and I talked to a lot of them in the course of what I do. But, um, and, and, and so you're arteries get harder as a consequence of eating salt and your blood pressure goes up over time. So even if you don't have high blood pressure, 
um, in the long run, you really might be giving yourself high blood pressure or damaging your kidneys. And um, the other thing I learned about salt is that it puts you at risk for a hyperbaric stroke. I think that's what they call it. Um, independent of what it does to your blood pressure. So, so salt is bad stuff. It's really bad stuff. And we're not really meant to eat as much as we do. Yeah. I don't salt food uh, at all. Um, and, um, but I do like that. I, I like it. I mean, to me, like my sort of go-to uh, food and I, and I, and I've eliminated it, but I think about it sometimes is pretzels. Oh, yeah. that, that's got everything. It's got, it's got the salt, it's got the crunch, it's got the carbs. Um, and it's just, it takes a while to eat. So you're satisfied that chewing part of the, the brain that kind of likes yeah. that. The oral um, aggression. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was eating them uh, way too much and I didn't feel good. So I had to, I had to eliminate them. And the hardest part was just taking the box that I had, the sourdough uh, pretzels that I had that I loved. And I don't even know how much sourdough was in them. I threw them out. Yeah. And that's, I think that is a really empowering thing to do. It's like, well, I bought these, it's a new box. Fuck it. I'm throwing them out. Yeah. Because what, what I tell people is that if you've made a rule for yourself that um, a certain food is off limits for you, then it's really poison. Then it's really poison to your body. You've made that decision when you were of sound mind and body and you had the fortitude and mental clarity to um, want to decide about that. And so if you find yourself in a supermarket having purchased a box of pretzels, um, you can still say to yourself, well, this is poison whether I bought it or not. And poison belongs in the garbage. I don't want it near my near my body. You can still it's a that. great thing to, to look at things. That, I do that too with certain things. I'm like, I'm not eating that poison it's kind of like like a bakery to me as good as it smells and as delicious as everything tastes and looks did you ever read the odyssey when they were uh, on the on the ship and the sirens are singing on the shore and yeah these beautiful yeah. women singing and they lure you to the rocks where you crash and die and yeah that's how i look at a bakery <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, because I, I've I've fought numerous wars with black and white cookies and lost, so I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, I know that product. <laughs> yep, they're yeah. big too. Yeah. <laughs> Those did, giant did you ones. Have, yeah, go ahead. No, did you have another question, or do you want me to kind of proceed to some of the other things that would be useful for people to? to yeah, know? well, yeah, you know what? Let's talk. I, I do have some questions, but let, let them come as they as they will. I, I'd love to hear some more about what uh, okay. you're doing. So remember that what we discovered was that the overeating impulse, that part of you that says just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt or makes you throw out the diet book on Monday afternoon when you swore to it on Monday morning. Um, it's a misfiring of the survival drive. It's a misfire. It's the, the emergency survival system has been activated and directed towards something that doesn't really belong directed towards. And so there are a couple of other things you can do to be able to calm down and make the right choice and, and de-escalate that emergency response system. It's called the sympathetic nervous system. It's the part of us that is designed to escape from a hungry bear or you know, find a rich source of calories in the middle of a famine, that kind of thing, and say, well, you better hoard that as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you, you, if you make a rule for yourself, I will never have chocolate on a weekday, and you hear your pig or your food demon saying, you know, gee, you can just start tomorrow, go ahead and have the chocolate, you know that that's a pig squeal, and you know that that's a problem. That's going to lead you to break your rules and be very unhappy about it. So you know that the emergency activation system is firing. At that point, if you take a deep breath and breathe out for longer than you breathed in, you're going to signal your nervous system that there's no emergency. So I, we call these seven eleven breaths. I got that from Laurie Hammond. And if you breathe in for a count of seven and out for a count of 11, which I'm not doing right now in the interest of time, you, you, you wouldn't be able to do that if a hungry bear was chasing you. If a hungry bear was chasing you, you'd be going. Yeah. Sure. But if you breathe out for longer than you breathe in, your brain knows 
that nothing is particularly urgent and it can activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our brain that's part of our whole nervous system that says it's okay to rest and digest and make strategic plans at this point and think about the future. There's nothing we have to take care of in the immediate present. There is no emergency. And so if that's the first thing you do when you, you take three seven eleven breaths, when you hear this pig squealing for slop, that's going to make it less likely that you feel like you have to act on it. Then if you write down specifically what the pig is saying, writing is an upper brain activity. You know, it's much more in the neocortex than it is in the, um, in the reptilian brain, whereas binging is a lower brain activity. So that's going to take you further into the realm where you can win the battle. It's going to take you into the realm of language. And language is the food of the intellect, and it really facilitates the, um, the resistance and or channeling of impulse into more constructive aims. There's a reason that society is based upon written laws. It's not just because we can't forget them. It's because uh, the law is a body of literature that suggests how we should live. What should we do with these impulses in order to, to get along the best way and you know, have as much freedom as we possibly can and have the happiest lives that we, that we, can, that we can accomplish. Um, so you, you want to start you want to start taking those breaths and then writing down what the pig says, why you should break the rule. Then you want to take another breath and ask yourself, why is the pig wrong? How is it lying to me? And I, I gave an example of that when I told you that um, the pig says you can just start tomorrow. Well, neuroplasticity links the craving and the the behavior together makes the craving stronger. It also makes the thought stronger. So if you have a donut after you say, just start your diet tomorrow, you're more likely to say, just start your diet tomorrow, tomorrow. So you start this negative snowball when you do that. Um, so, so write them down, disempower what the pig is saying, look, look at the cancerous logic, and then resolve to ignore it in the future. It becomes a lot easier to ignore it in the future when you've seen what's wrong with the pig's logic. So that, that's the basic procedure. You can also start to link it to um, several things in the future and several things in the present. So in the future, you can ask yourself, why will I become a better, happier person if I stick to my role? And that only begins with, well, because I'll lose weight and feel, you know, and feel proud of myself and look better in clothes. It proceeds to having more energy, to feeling like the master of my own fate, to feeling like I'm in control and can accomplish things, to being a better wife or husband or parent or role model for my kids. Um, you know, you could go on and on, but what, what's your personal reason? If you were to follow this one rule that you made for one whole year without error, what would happen? How would your life get better? What would I see one year from today? And so you can link that to that. And that brings a little bit of happiness into the present and a reminder about where you're going. What's even more powerful is you can ask yourself, what will I give up if I break this rule now immediately? You might be giving up a good night's sleep. If I had six chocolate bars, I never slept well that night. You might be giving up um, being able to work tomorrow. You know, if you have a whole pizza, it's kind of takes a 24 to 40 hour, eight hours to get through you and you won't feel like you're as productive. You might be giving up um, having the energy to play with your dog tonight. You might be giving up um, waking up with, you know, clear skin and mental clarity and a fresh outlook because when you break your rule, then you start to obsess about, well, how much am I going to have? How am I going to stop myself? How am I going to hide the evidence? How am I going to make up for it? you know, tomorrow and on and on and on. And then maybe I can get away with a little more and a little more and a little more. And the thoughts start to overtake your mind. Whereas if you just follow one simple rule, then you feel like you're in control and you've got clarity. So um, I just wanted to get that, that technique across. For I love that technique. That's really uh, some very specific tools that people can use. And I, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't, that can transfer to some other addictions and help hmm. with those too, such as um, 
drugs and alcohol, gambling, um, sex addiction. I, you know, I mean, those things are very, they're, they're all very primal kinds of things that people, um, act out on. Um, I'm not saying it's a replacement for other forms of treatment, but it, it certainly is, um, some great tools. The breathing technique, it sounds amazing. I've never done that one. I, I love that. And the writing, yes, I have done that. And, and not only when I, when I write, the brain registers the information differently than if I just think it or say it. I don't know what that is. It's just the way it is. There's a tactile thing with holding a pen or a pencil and just the, the visual of seeing the words that you're writing. Um, well, it really, also, when you're writing, you're not subject to the limitations of short-term memory. We, yeah. we can only keep six or seven things in our mind at the same time. And when you write things down, you can see the totality of the pig's logic and you can break its logic more easily. It's almost like exposing it soft underbelly, you know, in, in the war. You can, you can expose that more easily in writing than you can in your head. So I do encourage people to write it down. I want to ask you about... And the other thing that happens when you're in the, in the cycle of, you know, the eating and stuff is that you lose a, you lose connection with other people in the way that you would, that you wouldn't have if you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question would be, um, I'm thinking about, um, I know quite a bit about 12 step programs and pr particularly I do, do know a lot about Overeaters Anonymous. And one of the things they have there is um, well, there's the spiritual component that's in all the 12 step programs. And you mentioned it earlier. I want to talk about that, but, and the connection with other people, but also they also have what they have uh, uh, red light, yellow light, and green light foods. Green light foods are okay to eat anytime yellow light, you know, it's sort of on the border. Don't do it too much. And red light is kind of what you talked about. That's an absolute, I'm not doing that because I know what happens. So that that part is similar, but the and you did mention uh, Overeaters Anonymous earlier is is not didn't work for you necessarily. It doesn't work for some people, but I I have seen a number of people that do very well with that because of the spiritual aspect and the connection with other people on a regular basis. Yes, are, are you asking me a question about it? The question is, how do you, you know, is, well, is all overeating this reptilian brain or is there some about, is there love myself to fill the hole enough to not want to eat? Is, is that a part of it too? You're, you're correct that when you're involved with overeating, that you are taking yourself away from connections with other people and contributing to society. And it's, it's a very isolating activity. Yeah. You know, I, I think about sitting in, in the back of a parking lot with a, you know, a bag or a box or a container and then going home and sitting bloated on the couch for the next 12 hours or so. Uh. <laughs> so, so and, and none of that involves um, connecting with loving or making a contribution to, to society. Um, the, I, I, the relationship between emotion and overeating is complex. It's not as, so most people think I'm emotionally upset and therefore I want to overeat, mm -hmm. right? And so the emotions cause the overeating. Well, first of all, and I, I'm, doing a visual illustration with my hand, but it's not going to come out on the audio. Um, so just, I'll tell you that the relationship does go both ways, but it's also mediated by thoughts in some way. So first of all, um, saying that, you know, I was too lonely or um, isolated or, or depressed, and that triggered me to eat, it's somewhat accurate, but not totally accurate because it's omitting the space between stimulus and response. And the, there is this drive to overeat when you, when you feel emotionally disturbed because the nervous system is less capable of conducting the emotions when the digestive system is overloaded. And so we do get this quote unquote numbing out effect. And that's what people in Overeaters Anonymous will talk about. And they'll say, well, it's better to reach out to another person than to 
than to numb out. That's all true. That, that's all well and good. We can talk about things I am not happy about with it over as anonymous if you want to afterwards. But you, if you promise yourself to eat a particular way and then you suddenly didn't, there's, there is a set of mediating thoughts that you are either aware of or not which justify that action. And there has to be because we know as psychologists that people are driven to maintain a unified identity. And there's a phenomenon called cognitive dissonance when you'd find that your actions are discrepant from what you've committed to do. And so there has to be some voice of justification that reconciles those two, otherwise you feel too much psychological pain. And that, that voice of justification is where we focus between the emotion and the, um, and the action. So we're, we're not trying to solve the emotion and we're not saying that you shouldn't try to solve the emotion. By all means, reach out to other people, call mm -hmm. your therapist. Um, it's, it's an important, you know, it's an important thing to do, but we can sever the link between, between that emotional excitation and the overeating so it doesn't do any damage. And then you're in a much better position, first of all, to feel the emotions more deeply so you can look into them with your therapist or call your friends and talk about them or build more social relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you're in a much better position to do that because you'll feel them more deeply and you will physically feel much better when your addiction is. So, so, so the main thing I'm trying to get across is don't, the problem in our society with the way that people think about emotions and overeating is that they think that they have to solve the emotional problem before they can stop overeating. And that could take five or 10 years, right? You working, you know, working in Overeaters Anonymous, working with your therapist, journaling, doing all the self-help you possibly can, self-care, that can take five or 10 years. I, I prefer that people sever the link in a matter of a couple of months and then their lives get so much better. They feel better about themselves because their life is so much better. Um, and then the, the self-development goes on, you know, goes on steroids because you have that. I want to say one more thing about the emotions of people, not real, two more things. One thing is we're not just looking to quote unquote numb out. It's part of the experience, but what you're missing in that descriptor is that the things we quote unquote numb out with are more drug-like than anesthesia-like. So, you know, we did not have chocolate bars in the savannah. That, that's an unnatural concentration of, you know, theobramine and caffeine and sugar and fat and vanilla. And it's, um, it's, an, it's more pleasure than we were evolutionarily prepared for. <laughs> we're actually kind of getting high with food. That, that's actually what we're doing. And you can, I'm gonna tell you a silly joke, but it really does illustrate why we're not just numbing out with food. When you go to the dentist, does he ever say, I'm sorry, I'm out of Novocaine. Can I inject you with chocolate instead? It's right? <laughs> No, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Because <laughs> chocolate does something besides numbing you out or help you escape, right? Uh, or, or would you like a piece of pizza instead and we'll just go without the Novocaine? They don't, they don't do that. The last thing I want you to understand about the relationship between um, emotions and overeating is that it goes both ways. So... Um, let's take anxiety. A lot of people will classically tell me that they can't get to sleep at night without overeating because they're too anxious and that the, the food calms them down enough sure. that they can go to sleep. Yeah. Well, okay. Anxiety is a physiological experience that you put a cognitive label on. You put a thought label on. Anxiety usually involves um, elevated heart rate, blood pressure, galvanic sin response, perspiration, respiration. You can measure those things in animals. We can't ask them if they're feeling anxious, but you can measure those things in animals. You could give them a food reward whenever those things go up. So for example, there's a study with baboons where whenever their blood pressure went up, they gave them a sugar reward. And don't you know that those baboons were then seen to have consistently elevated blood pressure. The body learned to elevate the blood pressure in order to get the food reward. What that says is that it's entirely possible that all these things that we're eating to quote unquote numb out or go to sleep, they, they temporarily overload the digestive system so you don't have the feeling or the anxiety as much as you, you did. 
but they've simultaneously taught your body to produce the physiological state of anxiety uh, on a more consistent, regular basis. So you're actually creating the problem that you're trying to escape from by overeating. You see this with cigarettes also. People think that cigarettes calms them down, but if you measure um, you know, blood pressure and things like that for, for smokers versus non-smokers, smokers have consistently higher blood pressure because they're smoking, right? So they've, they've, actually, um, they've actually created the problem that they think that smoking is fixing. So it's, um, it's a misunderstanding of the relationship to say that it's just one way. It actually goes both ways. The implication of that is you probably have to tell your pig or your food monster that you're willing to go through any, any unpleasant emotion without overeating. If you made this rule, you're willing to keep it no matter what you feel. And the feeling probably won't last as long as you think it does, especially if you call your friends or your therapist or go hug your dog or you know, do some journaling or something like that, if you do more constructive things. So I hope I, ex I, hope I explained what I was saying. I, yeah. But, yeah, it's really yeah, it's really interesting to to work backwards from what you think is the the end and make that also the beginning. That it, it's it's sort of a loop. It's like a loop of yeah, um, you're creating a snowball. Yeah, you know the person that I know that um, the most the uh, you know that has overeating issues. Um, she will say, "I know I shouldn't eat it, but I really need it. I need it." Because this thing happened and I'm troubled by it. I really need it. Um, she, which should says, stop, she should stop saying that. that I agree. I agree. Because <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's um, it, you know, it's based on, well, it's worked for me before, but it, which it really hasn't. That's actually not true. It's, it, it works temporarily. It's the same as, you know, uh, you know, having a, an alcohol drink. You know, I'm kind of jumpy. I'm going to calm down and get get a little bit of a buzz on. Well, it does work temporarily, and then you then the person finds that they're drunk, and they have other issues, and you know all the same kinds of things. So that those things that we tell ourselves are really important. Is I think that's what you're saying. You know, our perception of what's going on is probably not correct in in a lot of the cases. Right. Or accurate. You should ask yourself what she does need, though. I mean, maybe it's a hug. Maybe it's some food. Maybe it's some real food. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a nap. Maybe it's just some time away from all the inputs and decision making. We, we find that uh, uh, willpower seems to be drained by constant decision making. And when oh. people have the ability to step away from those decisions for a little while, they find they have more willpower. Um, so we, we wake up with a lot of willpower like gas in the tank and then it's drained over the course of the day by all the decisions we make, not just food decisions, by the way. We find that people have trouble resisting marshmallows if you make them do math problems first. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, the, it's the emails that you're trying to figure out. Do I, do I delete this? Do I forward it? Do I um, defer it? You're making little decisions all day long, and it's taking some brain glucose to get through that, and that wears down on your willpower, um, which is why rules work better than guidelines. Like Some people will say, well, if you're having trouble with chocolate, just have it 10% of the time and not 90% of the time. And I'll say, well, the problem with that is what's the 10% and what's the 90%? I, I'm going to have to make food decisions every time I'm, I'm at Starbucks like that. Whereas if I say I'm only going to have it on Saturdays and I've almost, yeah. the math doesn't quite work, but you know what I mean? But my decisions have yeah. been made for me all week long. I don't have to worry about it. Well, it's clear boundaries that you're making for yourselves. So you never have to wonder. Right. Which is a really, you know, intelligent way to go about that. I can use my, my thinking for better things. I, I'm looking at some of your uh, points on your, your uh, sheet here. Um, and you've just talked about reprogramming to uh, think like a permanently thin person. I like that. That's kind of what you've just been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're changing the way that you think. Which you're deciding to become a different person with food. If I ask people, do you think you could never have chocolate on a weekday again? I go, oh, I don't know. If I ask them, do you think you could become a person who doesn't have chocolate during the week? They go, yeah, I could do that. 
the, the reason for that is that we all have these unwritten rules of character. We all, like, like if, if you walked into a diner and there was a $20 bill on the table and the waitress says, I'll be right back. I just have to get you a menu. And she didn't see her tip yet. And there was nobody that could see you and there were no video cameras. You probably still wouldn't take that $20 bill, right? Absolutely not. No, never. Be, be, because you're not a thief. Right. You've got this unwritten rule inside that because of the kind of person you want to be in the world, that you never steal. You never take other people's money. Um, so this way of going about things is just more, um, more specifically and deliberately writing your rules of character for yourself when it comes to food. Now, some people are very frightened of these rules because they say, well, what if I do make a mistake? How does the rule have any meaning, right? Um, and then if they do make a mistake, they, their pig says, oh, you're pathetic, you're nothing, you forget these silly rules, and let's just, let's just go to town for a day or two. But what I want you to think about is committing with perfection, but forgiving yourself with dignity. Committing mm -hmm. with perfection, but forgiving yourself with dignity. So when an Olympic archer is aiming at the bullseye, uh, and they don't hit the bullseye 100% of the time, by the way, but when the Olympic archer aims at the bullseye, they're not thinking maybe I'll hit it and maybe I won't. They actually, they have to see the arrow sure. going into the bullseye before they let go of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they miss the bullseye, they ask themselves by how much, in what direction? So what specific adjustments do I have to make? Th the reason that committing with perfection is so important is that if you're thinking maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't, you're draining mental energy that could be focused on accomplishing the goal instead. So the psychology of winning is focusing with the totality of your, of your soul on the goal that you want to accomplish. Um, it's okay to present your food rules as if they are set in stone to your pig, because your pig is like a two-year-old with food. And when my niece was two, year old, two years old, for example, I told her, Sarah, you can never, ever, 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 ever cross the street without holding my hand. I don't want you to even think about going through the street without holding my hand. Okay, Uncle Glenn, right? I knew that when she got older, she was going to learn how to cross the street without, without holding my hand. Was I lying to her? Yeah. Is it okay that I was lying to her? Yeah. It was, it was for her own good. Absolutely, yeah. If you tell your pig, maybe we're going to change this rule later. It will say, is it time? Is it time? Is it time? Right? <laughs> Why later? It Why not now? <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly. If I'm going to do it later anyway, might as well do it right now. So, yeah. so you got to present the rules as if they're set in stone to, um, to your pick. Now, when it comes to alcohol, by the way, I prefer that people use Jack Trimpey's work, which is Rational Recovery. Um, they, he's wrote a book called Rational Recovery. The reason is that alcoholics are capable of getting into a car and maybe mutilating somebody, you know, and, and, and so you can't be as loose about forgiving yourself. You have to be a little, you understand it as more of a moral decision to, um, you know, not drink and drive. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you know that taking one drink might lead you to get drunk and get into a car and hurt someone, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I, I would recommend you read rational recovery instead if, if you're having struggle with drugs or alcohol, but you're correct about, you know, gambling and sex addiction. And um, you can even use this type of technique for uh, productivity and parenting and finance and all, all types of other things. But we really specialize with binge eating, binge eating and overeating. My experience with overeaters is that, that there are certain foods that, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, scratch the itch and the monster's out. And they're and and soon as they eat it, like you say, with you know maybe chocolate. If I eat a piece of chocolate and I'm somebody that is triggered by that, then the monster's out. And then I'm yeah. going to pizza, and then I'm going to salty foods, and then I'm going. And I, is that the case with food? Because I've seen that where, where yeah. there's certain foods that are just talk about a monster. It's like you start with a little thing, and then you're off and running. Sometimes for months or years. There are um, substances from which people have to abstain and there are substances which they can moderate. Yes. I, statistically, I find that about two thirds of our client are able to moderate any given substance with the right roles and one third really have to abstain. I eventually evolved to never having chocolate again. I, I don't miss it. I haven't had it in years. 
Uh, you could throw me into a big bathtub filled with chocolate and I wouldn't open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like a big bag of chemicals to me. I wonder why I ever craved it. Yeah. Um, it, it took about a year and a half to get to that point. But I, I, I eventually decided that I, I do much better when I don't have any chocolate at all. Um, same with sugar. Uh, flour, occasionally I will plan out a vegan pizza for myself. And I, um, I always wish that I didn't do it after I do it, but it doesn't, I don't go have five vegan pizzas after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was able to come up with rules that worked out okay for that. Yeah. Basically, I always say I'm on the side of what works. And if it works, then keep doing it. And if it doesn't work, you might want to consider if, eliminating. If, you, if, if you're not able to stop, I would suggest you try a plan without sugar, flour, or alcohol for 30 days. You, you're, you're, I don't think there's any doctor that's going to diagnose you with a sugar, flour, and alcohol deficiency in 30 days. Um, <laughs> you're alcohol I, deficient, I, I, sir. <laughs> if you are really struggling, get rid of those three poisons for 30 days and then decide whether you want to reintroduce them into your, into your life or not. It, it might be a miracle. Most people um, don't know that they might only be 100 hours from freedom. A lot of people have mm. never wiped those things out of their system for a hundred hours. And so they're constantly feeling these cravings and, and it might be that it's a sugar, flour and alcohol that are generating those cravings. And you just got to go through the withdrawal and you'll, you'll be so much better. Um, so a lot of other people say, you know what? I don't want to give up chocolate bars. I don't want to give this up. Okay. So try, try the moderation first, but let's, but be very specific. Don't say you're going to have a little bit of bread at a restaurant on Saturday. Say, um, I never, I will never eat bread except for Saturday evening with my husband, you know, two pieces mm -hmm. at this great restaurant and make, make the decision beforehand. Don't make it in the environment. Of temptation. Yeah. This is great stuff. I just, uh, if people want to embark on this journey with uh, the, some of the things you're suggesting or all of the things you're suggesting, how do they contact you? I know you have a website and uh, there's some yeah. literature. Let's, let's talk about that. Well, the website's the best place. If you go to neverbingeagain.com and you click the big red button, I will give you three free things. You need to sign up for the reader bonus list. Um, first of all, you can have a copy of the book Never Binge Again for free in Kindle, Nook, or PDF format. Totally free. All the, those digital formats are free. We do have Audible and paperback if you prefer that, but um, there's a charge for that. Then I'll give you a set of food plan starter templates. So it's very important you come up with your own food rules because if you adopt mine, first of all, you'll probably run away screaming if you adopt mine because I've been at this for 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, but even so, if I gave you mine and you decided to follow mine, eventually your pig is going to say, that doctor's plan doesn't work. We might as well keep binging until we can find another one. So we find that independence is a very important part of recovery and it's time to come up with your own food, food rules. You've read enough. You've talked to enough doctors. Um, you can talk to another doctor if you want to, but, but um, take responsibility for yourself. However, we made these starter templates for any dietary philosophy you might imagine. So there's one for whole foods plant-based like I eat. There's one for ketogenics. There's one for point counters, calorie counters. There are a lot of philosophies out there. Mm -hmm. So we just thought we'd get you started. The last thing you'll get is a set of recorded coaching sessions. This is all free. The reason I wanted to show you with full recorded sessions how um, how the system works is that I know you all must be thinking, this sound, this guy sounds like a lunatic. Why does Bob have this doctor on that says he has a pig <laughs> inside of him? Um, this must sound really harsh and cruel. And the truth is that it's anything but it, it um, this is a very life-giving process. And I wanted you to hear how I compassionately take people from feeling hopeless and despairing and confused about how to ever stop overeating to feeling hopeful and excited and enthusiastic in just one session. So it's all free, neverbingeagain.com. Click the big red button. Wonderful. What a great way to start people off on a, on a new way of living. It really is a new way of life is what you're talking about, but not... It's not going to, it's not, it's going to improve all the other aspects of your life. If, if you get that under control, because who wants to be a slave to anything, really? It's just. If what I discovered, and if you're anything like me, either you're your, either you're your pig's master or you're going to be your pig's B-I-A-T-C-H. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and life as your pig's bitch is just no fun. It's, it's just no fun. No, it's, it, you know, I, I don't want to be the, the a slave to anything. I just, you know, and it's, it's an interesting thing because um, there's a defiance and I'm going to eat whatever I want, you know, the, and for all sort of addictions, there's a defiance of this is, I'm going to do this. No one's telling me what to do. I'm going to do this. But the fact is the thing that you're doing becomes the slave master and, and you don't have this freedom that you say you're, you're convincing yes. yourself you're having. Freedom is actually built on top of discipline. Most people don't know this. Most people think that discipline takes away your freedom. But um, think about a jazz pianist. The only reason they can improvise with their soul is because they know the structure of music and they spent years practicing scales and studying, you know, where, where do they come back to so that it all holds together? The only reason you can drive anywhere you want to is because of the discipline of the engineers we set it up that when they turn, when you turn the wheel 30 degrees to the right, your, your wheels go 30 degrees to the right. If that wasn't true, you'd have a much smaller life. So <laughs> yes, no, that's free, free, freedom sits on top of discipline. Discipline empowers freedom. It doesn't take it away. I am so happy to have met you and, and talked to you about this. And I hope people go to your website. This is a, incredibly valuable information. There are so many people that struggle with food. Um, we are, uh, can be very victimized by, as you said, the corporations and the marketing people. Uh, I, I look at the cereal aisle in a grocery store. It's a, I don't go down it, but it's, it's an amazing place to see what does not work. <laughs> the cereal aisle at a grocery store, bright colors, uh, fun little boxes with more nutrition in the cardboard that they're in than the actual substances inside. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day and I uh, appreciate it. And I'll send you a copy when I'm uh, edited. Okay. This is big right. fun. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Thank you. Much appreciation for you folks listening to The Exploding Human. Again, theexplodinghuman.com. The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman YouTube channel and the Exploding Human Facebook page. You can listen to the show there. Big, big thanks to Glenn Livingston. Check out his website if you want to find out more. Appreciate you guys listening to the show. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.